Good morning, Emmanuel family, and welcome to our time of worship today. If you're visiting with us today, uh, the vision of our fellowship here is to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, to feed the soul, and to go into the worlds. Please listen as I read this morning's call to worship, which is from Isaiah, the 58th chapter. If because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure in my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, despising your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word. Then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Please stand and sing with us. worship our king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and I know you will do it again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things God you do great things captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things hallelujah god above it all Hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things.
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless grace. To this I you, the great creator and king of all things. Who are we that you are mindful of us, Lord, the son of man, that you would care for us? 
And yet, God, you designed for us to live in fellowship with you, not just in this life, but for all eternity. God, through your spirit, I pray that you would capture our hearts, Lord, that we would be captivated by your word and your truth. God, as your gospel is presented, let it take root in good soil. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Please take a moment to fill out that connection card that's in front of you. Let us know how we can pray for you, how we can encourage you. Uh, As believers in Jesus Christ, we believe that today is a day of mercy and hope and forgiveness and love and joy in the Holy Spirit. We believe that Christ has risen from the dead. And uh, we're excited to be here this morning. Uh, Easter Sunday is right around the corner, and uh, we're going to have a couple of services that weekend. Please take note, we'll have a Good Friday service at 7 o'clock. Please come for that time of uh, reflection and communion and uh, just seeking God as we anticipate Resurrection Sunday. And then we'll have one service on Easter Sunday, 9 o'clock, the regular time, uh, followed by a time of refreshments and celebration. It's, uh, it's going to be a great weekend, and I hope that you and your friends uh, will invite one another to come and celebrate with us, new life in Christ. Uh, If you'd like to donate an Easter lily for that Sunday in remembrance of a loved one, you can do that. Let us know. Just place a check or a cash uh, in the the box in the back uh, noting uh, Easter lily and we'll get that for you. Men, 16 years and older, if you're interested in playing in the softball team uh, with Emmanuel, we'd love to have you. Uh, You guys are going to start meeting on Mondays in April. Uh, You can talk to uh, Mark St. Clair about details with that, but that's going to be a lot of fun, so we hope you can make it with that. And then lastly, uh, for the last couple of years, uh, Emmanuel has been retooling its international mission effort, and uh, the new initiative Uh, is called FOCUS 210, and it stands for this. FOCUS, F, first priority. We want to concentrate on a specific initiative without uh, neglecting those that we already have on our team, but we want to focus on one primary objective, and we want to set particular goals and how we engage with those initiatives. O, objectives-oriented. C, it's cooperative. We want to collaborate with all of our partners, but more specifically with one in particular. Uh, We want to unleash you. We want to unleash the potential that's there that perhaps has not been realized yet. And we also want to be as strategic. God has given Emmanuel a certain amount of resources, both for uh, the gospel reach here in our zip codes where you live, He's also given us resources to take the hope of Christ to our region. But he's also given us resources to take to the other side of the world. And so FOCUS uh, 210 really is a purposeful initiative uh, that we're trying to initiate here at Emmanuel to be more fruitful for the gospel here, near, and far. Uh, With that, I want to invite uh, one of our team members who's on this Focus uh, 210 initiative, uh, Bill Legos. He's going to come and uh, share with us and give us an update on that initiative. Bill, will you come and share with us? Morning, Emmanuel. As Pete has said, uh, the Focus 210 group has uh, been meeting regularly. Um, It's been uh, a lot of work. It's been a lot of prayer. We felt your prayer all throughout our meetings. Um, uh, Ephesians 210 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ, so he can do the good things he planned for us long, long ago. Um, This process has uh, taken us through uh, many challenges, many, um, many trials. We've looked at uh, the strengths of our church. We've looked at the, um, the people within our church and their gifts, uh, otherwise known as our DNA survey we, t- we took. Um, and they've pointed us to a, a very specific place, um, and that is Dakar, Senegal, uh, with the Martins. The Martins have, uh, are members of our church uh, here at EBC. They've... Uh, continue to serve the Lord in Dakar, and they, um, 
they need our help as well, right? God has called us to go help them. Uh, we're excited to make this next step in the process. Um, so they have been there since uh, in Dakar since uh, 2008. Uh, this is something that uh, they have on their heart. Their mission is, um, Bill is the leader of the San Mar uh, Metro West Initiative. He's also part of the three agency team reaching out to predominantly Muslim university students. His wife Kathy is a global worker and assists with logistical planning and administrative duties. They are also teaching English as a second language. Throughout the years, we have sent small, -term, uh, small team missions groups there. Um, and the Martin's vision um, going forward is as follows. We are asking God for 10% of the Dakar Metro population to become followers of Christ. When we say we are asking God, we recognize that this is something that only God can do. Only God can move. Uh, His Holy Spirit will have to move greatly uh, for this to be accomplished. Uh, the roots of the Baobab tribe uh, tree represent the prayer and support. That prayer and support is needed from this body. Um, Going forward, we will be asking uh, for prayer groups. Um, there's currently a prayer group going um, on uh, this past week. There was offered a 30-minute prayer uh, group took place on 7.30. And on Sunday, the 19th, they had a 4 p.m. slot that lasted about an hour. These are wonderful experience to hand firsthand what the Lord is doing in Dakar and what needs uh, their specific prayer concerns have. We have asked Ben to send out uh, any and all communications directly from the Martins via email. And uh, if you're not on the EBC mailing list, we ask that you uh, contact him and get on that uh, mailing list. Um, they also have social media pages that we can make available to you to, for you to see. And uh, we are working on gathering and preparing the team, uh, the next team, uh, for this trip to confirm the, the selection of the Martins in Dakar. Uh, please be praying for the 210 teams and the Martins uh, uh, as well, as God will put the names of those he wants to go on this next trip in our hearts as well. We thank you for this time. Thanks, Bill. We believe that uh, God has planted this church many decades ago for these zip codes. And we believe that God's work in this zip code and neighboring zip codes is not done. And we're excited to be a gospel presence uh, here in this zip code for our neighbors. And our hope again is as we continue to pray through Focus 210 and how we can reach the other side of the world that that will help to stimulate your missional heart for the people that live next to you. That you will grow in your desire to make Christ known and take opportunities as the Holy Spirit provides winsome conversations to share with people that the resurrection is real, that new life can be found that your past hurts can be forgiven and healed as you work through the ups and downs. We're all on a journey and we're all trying to figure it out, but God has given us his directions and his word and his spirit. So we're excited about the Focus 210 because we think it's a wonderful tool that God is using to stimulate vibrancy in our, in our congregation. Will you please bow with me in prayer? Father, your word says in Ephesians, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God, we bless you and praise you, Father, this morning for your kindness to us. We thank you, God, that you have deposited in us your Holy Spirit that guides us and teaches us, that rebukes us and comforts us, that conforms us to Christ and prepares us for eternity. We thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit that it is a constant 
Holy Spirit, you are a constant encourager to us to be faithful to the faith, to be faithful to you, Lord Jesus. Father, we ask that you would be with those uh, that are on the marriage retreat weekend to remember in Newport. God, we pray that you'd bless them as they uh, consider today their marital vows and where they've been in weeks or months or years past. Father, we pray for healing. We pray for hope. We pray for vibrancy in their marriages as they sit and engage with one another and with the teaching there about how to help create a healthy home. We pray, Lord, for those that cannot be with us today. We pray for Skip and Peg Gady. God, please continue to heal Skip. Encourage him in his healing time. We pray for those who have lost loved ones recently. Father, that you would give them uh, the wisdom to know how to grieve and how to uh, go through loss, but also, Father, how to rest in the empty grave and what you say. We pray, Holy Spirit, for new life and vibrancy of faith individually and corporately. God, that you would help us to become the church that you want us to be, both presently as well as for the next generation. God, you are more concerned about a holy church than a big church, so God, I pray that you would help us to pursue you in holiness, trusting God, you with the future. We love you, Lord, and we desire to worship Christ this day. Forgive us of our sins, Father, this day, this week. Thank you for the grace that you give every moment. We ask, God, now that you would continue to encourage us as we seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen. Recently, uh, in the Denver area, a story came out that uh, an aggressive Google Maps uh, direction led a group of drivers to get stuck in the mud on the way to Denver International Airport. There was an accident in uh, Aurora, Colorado, and it caused the GPS app to cause or direct people to a quicker route. Driver Connie Moses told reporters that she and about 100 other drivers seemed to be following the smartphone directions onto a dirt road, unbeknownst to them that uh, the drivers were going onto an unpaved dirt road uh, that had swelled with mud and caused many to get stuck. And uh, Moses said, my thought was, well, there are all these other cars in front of me, so it must be okay. So I just continued. Fortunately, were those with all-wheel drive vehicles were able to get through. Monsi says she picked up some stranded motorists and delivered them to the airport. And Denver 7 traffic anchor Jason Luber believes people are becoming too dependent on smartphones and GPS apps instead of maps. He says, you, you are driving. You are driving. Google Maps is not driving. Google Maps is not perfect. You need to know where you are going and if it does not look like that's where you need to go, you need to turn around. Has this ever happened to you? You put an address in your phone, and then it starts to give you a direction, and you start thinking, this, this actually doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't know why I'm going this way. But we mindlessly, without thinking, give our authority over to Google Maps. And really what we need to do is use our heads and go the direction that we know is better. I'm sure that we all, we all, we all can relate. And uh, we need to be using our heads. In our passage today, Timothy uh, is being instructed by Paul. And Paul is saying, Timothy, I want you to use your head. I want you to think I want you to pause because there are going to be other voices in your world, in your life, that are going to direct you in the wrong direction. And Paul has just told Timothy in chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, of the transcendent, amazing message of the gospel. The life, the death, the resurrection, ascension of Christ, the return of Christ. Paul has just said, this is what it's all about. 
If you want to go from point A to point B, Timothy, I've given you and I want you to give to the church these directions. Don't listen to other voices and go off roading. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 today as we continue our study today in God's household, uh, the blueprint for a healthy church. And uh, if you are able, would you please stand with me in honor of reading God's word. 1 Timothy chapter 4 says this, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit says clearly, explicitly that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things that are taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Would you please bow in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come, God, to you this morning in faith. And Lord, we desire to hear your voice. We ask God in Jesus' name now that we would know your will, that we would know your direction, that we would know your voice and how you would have us navigate this week. Father, as we live in community with each other. Father, your word says in Hebrews, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one of the daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Holy Spirit, we ask that you attune our hearts now to hear your voice and drown out the voice of the evil one in our heads and hearts. God, help us to be thankful today for all you've given us. And Father, may we be a healthy church that contends for the truth and are full of gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, amen. Amen, you may be seated. I want to talk to you today about how a healthy church contends for the faith and is thankful for God's provision. I want to talk to you today about how a healthy church contends for the faith and is thankful for all that God has provided. The Apostle Paul has just told us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, He says, Timothy, although I hope to come to you soon, the reason that I'm penning this letter is so that you will know how people ought to behave. So people ought to know how people should live and with one another in the context of the community, in the church of the living God, not dead God, but in the church of the living God, the church is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. That's why I'm writing you. And then Paul goes off in a very poetic way to describe the resurrection of Christ and who saw the resurrection of Christ. And he says in verse 16, Be all, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness of Christ is great. He appeared in the body. Paul is talking about the resurrection there. He was vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels as he came out of the empty grave. He was preached among the nations. He was believed on the world, was taken up in glory. This is our Christian hope. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the hope is is that Christ is no longer dead but alive. That means he has canceled the written code that your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven, are wiped away, removed as far as the east is from the west. Christ has risen from the dead, and that means that we have hope for eternity when Christ comes back as well as in the present. This is our Christian hope. And it is an eternal hope an all-powerful message that has been preached among all creation that the church through millennia clings to, and this is why we gather today. We gather to worship Jesus Christ, our resurrected Savior. We gather to feed our souls on the morrow of God's word, that we would be inspired to live and do good deeds in the name of Christ, that his name would be proclaimed, that life and forgiveness and hope is real and available. We live to... Worship Christ, feed the soul, and then go to the world. That's why Christ has called Emmanuel into existence. But Paul says in 1 Timothy 4 now, pen still moving, the great news that is transcendent about all creation from the time be, of, uh, from the very beginning, as awesome as this news is, 
It's a spiritual message, and you know what? There's going to be opposition. There's going to be opposition to this divine message. Paul says, Timothy, this is the message. But you know what? Chapter 4, verse 1, the Holy Spirit says there's going to be problems. There's going to be opposition. The Spirit explicitly, clearly, unquestionably says that you're going to have opposition to this message. And an outcome of the opposition is that some people are going to walk away. They're going to abandon. They're going to turn their backs. They're going to reverse course and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. Paul says, the reason that I'm writing this is so that you'll know how people should live with one another in the context of a faith community that worships Christ. But there's going to be opposition. There's going to be opposition. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 24. I want you to see this real quick. You can turn there with your own hands. See it with your own eyes. This is one footnote that I'm sure Paul is referring to. Matthew 24, verse 4. Jesus answered, watch out for no, that no one deceives you. Paul is talking about deceivers in 1 Timothy 4. Jesus says, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Church, the world is falling apart. It's no secret. But Jesus, in all authority, says, don't panic. Don't worry. Don't worry. Such things must happen, Jesus says. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. And then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. This is Jesus saying this. But he says, he says, don't be alarmed. Rest in me. Verse 10, at that time, many will turn away from the faith, 1 Timothy 4, 1, and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many because the increase of wickedness, 2023, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus, our Savior, King, resurrected Lord, has said, you know, this is how human history is going to unfold. I'm telling you now. But don't panic. But this is how it's, it's going to happen. Know me and rest in me, but this is what's going to happen. And Paul says in chapter 4, verse 1, 1 Timothy says, here's the message. The reality is that there's going to be opposition. There are going to be those that abandon the faith, their relationship to the faith. They will disassociate from the faith. They will reverse course from which they have originally believed. They will forsake the gospel. Instead of following the spirit of Christ and what God has revealed in the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ to whom he appeared to more than 500 eyewitnesses, the incredible transformational message, some are gonna, are gonna walk away. Some are just gonna walk away. And they're gonna turn to another spirit. But it's not just spirit, singular. Paul's talking plural. People will abandon and turn to the teaching of deceiving spirits and the teaching of demons. They will actively follow and place close attention to and agree with the, the doctrines or the teachings of demons. 
In chapter 3, 15 and 16, we read of the victory of the transcendence of the gospel. We're reminded in poetic form of Christ and the Holy Spirit's vindication and the resurrection of Jesus. We're reminded of the majesty of the global impact and the gospel preached to the nations and the acceptance of this life-transforming truth that God has come as a man, died in your place, rose from your grave. And now we read, there's going to be opposition. Jensen says this in his commentary, just as the coming of the Spirit had vindicated Christ, so now the Spirit was warning of people departing from the faith. It was to happen in later times, those times that Timothy was now enduring. It was already happening later times, back when Paul wrote this. But more than timing, Paul was explaining the means and the method by which these people would depart and the ministry that Timothy was to conduct in light of their departure. Listen real carefully now. As with the gospel, so the opposition to the gospel, the actions of the false messengers reveal the intersection of the supernatural and the natural. So those who depart will do so by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. It is one of the arrogant failures, Jensen says, it is one of the arrogant failures of modernity and post-modernity to think that all teaching and ideas are only human. If someone spits out a crazy idea, the idea is that that idea just comes from their brain. Jensen contends, along with the Apostle Paul, that there's going to be teaching that comes from another realm. But modernity, which ended around 1960, 1965, to post-modernity, which is now, the, the idea of modernity and post-modernity is that the spiritual arena doesn't exist. That's one of the greatest failures of our contemporary world and mind. We ignore the possibility that ideas come from a spiritual world. But Paul is real hard and clear explicitly. No, there is ideas that come and plant in your brain that come from the spiritual arena. This is something that all of us have to grapple with. In other words, Paul is saying that there is a real spiritual battle going on here. That there are two sides. There's a spiritual world, there's a physical world. In the spiritual world that we cannot see, Satan, the devil, the accuser, the father of lies, seeks to take hold of the souls of men. And they're real. God is not frustrated by the devil. He's not threatened by the devil. For reasons beyond us, he has allowed him a certain leash. But if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians. I want to show you something this morning in respect to the unseen world. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And hopefully this will give us a, more, a better awareness and appreciation. We are to respect the devil, but we are to not be afraid of him. Thinking about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 uh, Paul is talking about the man of lawlessness, uh, sometimes known as the Antichrist. And Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5, don't you remember that when I was with you, Paul is saying to Thess the church in Thessalonica, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him, the man of lawlessness, back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. There will be a time when the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, will be more obvious. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Listen to this closely. But then the lawlessness will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth 
There will not be any sword clanging or shield raising or nuclear blasts. Jesus Christ, king of all creation, spoke everything into creation with a word. He will say, we're done. It's over. The time has come, and he will simply breathe on Satan and his minions, and it will be done. He will simply breathe. There is no contest. It's not like Jesus is here and Satan is here or maybe Satan is here. There is no contest. Jesus has existed for eternity past with the Father and the Spirit before the first sun rose in Genesis 1. Jesus has existed for eternity past, and we will worship him forever in eternity future. Satan is a created being that for some reason God allowed to accomplish his plan. But in this day and age, there are people who abandon the faith and will turn to the deceiver and say, I want to follow that way instead. But when the time is Right, God's time, he will say, that's the biblical narrative. That is what the Bible teaches. The opposition is real, though, in which we live. And Paul's articulating where this teaching is coming from. It's not coming from man. It's coming from deceiving spirits and teachings taught by demons. And there are those who hold to the faith. There are those who hold to the faith, and there are those who abandon the faith. What is the faith? 1 Corinthians 15 gives us the most, one of the most concise definitions. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And here it is. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What is it that Christ died for our sins? that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is one of the most concise explanations of the gospel, that he died for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised. And Paul here in 1 Timothy 4 to the church in Ephesus, he is teaching uh, to be aware of false doctrines, false teachings uh, that have particularly uh, to do with the teachings of legalism and asceticism. And we'll get to that in a moment. But for a moment, I want to digress and just articulate briefly other teachings that are out there, not exhaustive, but teachings of demons that are presently are flying around that we have to contend with every day. Joseph Kahn, he is a messianic Jewish pastor and author. In his book, Return of the Gods, I find this a very provocative read, but he says the priests and the prophets of ancient Israel were constantly contending with rival gods of the Near East. The Israelites were always being tempted to abandon the worship of the one true God in favor of Baal and other demonic entities worshipped as divinity by other tribes of the region. Are there other gods in our world or region that people turn to? So Khan suggests that there is an unholy trinity. The God of Baal, Ashtoreth, and Molech. And although Jesus conquered Khan says, although Jesus conquered these gods, they did not cease to exist. However, when a person did to the worship of, did turn, return to the worship uh, of false gods or demonic forces, that invitation is given and they are once can exert that, that spiritual power that they have. The God of Baal, he's the God of fertility 
and the God of abundance. We can see his idol on Wall Street. The symbol of Baal is a bull. And does not America, both in the church and outside of the church, worship the God of abundance and sexuality? The God of Asher is the Babylonian goddess of love and the goddess of sacred prostitution and gender fluidity. I've done the research. And this is seen in our libraries and on Main Street in Pride Pride Parades. And the God of Moloch, to whom the ancient Near East sacrificed their children. And although Paul is talking at 1 Timothy chapter 4 about addressing the abandonment of the true faith to the God of self-determination and, and legalism and moralism, any teaching that is not in line with the gospel and God's word is a teaching or doctrine that's taught by demons. But the reason we bristle at that is because we still cling to the mindset of enlightenment that science is God, that there isn't a spiritual arena. But as the world continues to unfold and unleash its personal narrative and reality, more and more we will see that these not are simply ideas conjured up by the human mind. And so respectfully, I push back and contemporary culture to say, no, there is a spiritual arena. There are two sides. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, God of all creation, and Satan, liar and deceiver. And God says here in 1 Timothy 4, in latter times there are gonna be people who are gonna abandon and walk away from the faith. And instead, Paul says, they're gonna be people who turn to embrace the teaching of demons. The world has a hard time with us any time the world says, no, this is true. But should the Christian not come back and say, no, God's word is true. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what God has to say is true. Is the Christian simply to accept and do nothing as evil advances? How you process that in the context of love and the Holy Spirit's guidance as you engage with people around you is between you and the Lord. God wants us to be winsome but also truth bearers in the context of coming next to and butting up next to these teachings that are clearly false and anti God, there is light and there is dark. There is life and there is death. There is evil and there is good. And the Bible says there's in between land. There is no in between land. But the world hates it when we say that Jesus Christ is King and Lord of all. The world hates it when we say, no, come and turn to God for life, for healing, for hope, for forgiveness, for eternal, for eternal life. They hate it. But it does not relieve the Christian from standing on the word of God and saying, no, Jesus is who he says he is. Guzik says in his commentary, it's hard to say if there is more false teaching today or if it's merely a case of modern technology being able to spread the lie better. But the old saying is certainly true today. A lie travels express. The truth goes on foot. And more people within the church are following these doctrines of demons. And then Paul says, 1 Timothy 4, 2, such things come through. They come through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared as with hot iron. The teaching doesn't come from, it comes through, it comes by a particular kind of person, a hypocritical liar. 
They may be telling you one thing, but the reality is what is really hidden in their hearts. They may be asking for peace, but there's really no peace desired at all. They are teaching a belief system for another reason. What you hear is not really what it's motivated by. But the truth has been deposited in the church of the living God. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised. And what these, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 2, as these teachings are coming from deceiving spirits through these people with the purpose of intentionally bringing untrue things. And it comes from the father of lies whom he has taken captive to do his will. And so their consciences have been seared, cauterized, burned. They no longer respond to the up and the down, the right and the wrong. It's, it's so unfeeling that they don't know right from wrong. But they deliberately teach false things. And here in 4, 1 and 2, Paul is planting his feet firmly for Timothy and reminding him that there is going to be obvious opposition to the truth of the gospel. There will be opposition. And their consciences have been seared. That Greek word there, seared, is a perfect passive. What that means is it's absolute and it's been acted upon from an outside source meaning that their consciences are no longer active, they're absolutely seared, but that searing came from a force outside of themselves. And they're completely insensitive to conscience. They've shut down. And one of the things that Paul says uh, that they do is they, for, they forbid people to marry. Now we're getting into the asceticism or the self-denial or the legalism. They command people to stay away from specific foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving for those who believe and know the truth. They're forbidding people from getting married to keep away from certain foods. In the East, self-denial and legalism as a religious expression of the moralist and it's opposite to our hedonism and pleasure-seeking culture. But Paul is impressing upon them that legalism was a departure from the gospel of grace. Legalism is a departure from the gospel of grace. Legalism is a departure from the gospel of grace. That somehow if we just follow all of these rules, God is somehow obligated to us. Interesting to note that within the church, sometimes we can have more rules than God. And these false teachers taught that somehow we could be more holy if we abstain from certain foods and getting married. And we think that somehow if we follow all these rules that somehow God is obligated to us for more blessings, more mercy, more forgiveness. And I have them under my thumb. But Paul says in Romans 3, but now righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from God and comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely through his grace. We cannot earn our salvation. This is the message of grace. You cannot keep a good enough moral checklist for God to be obligated to you. God bestows on us his limitless patience and grace and mercy solely based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross. No matter how often you go to church, how much you pray, how much you do a good work, this person, that person, how often you take communion, do confession, it's not based our salvation, our right standing with God is not based on how well we perform. It is based on God's kindness and mercy and grace 
to you. And Paul is going head to head with these moralists. And Paul has just told us in chapter 3, verses, uh, verses 8 through 15, that an overseer, an elder, a deacon, should be, one criteria, is a man who has a family. Because it's in the context of the family that a man can learn leadership if he is to manage God's household. And Paul says, these false teachers are leading you astray telling you that marriage and food isn't good. Stay away. Paul's saying, no. Get together, enjoy. Enjoy the food that God has given you. Enjoy what God has made. Feast with your family of faith. And Paul counters for, in verse four, for everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and in prayer. Everything that God has created is good. You don't need to prove your devotion to God by being a moralist. What God has given us, we are to receive with thanks. What you're wearing today, your clothes, where you're gonna eat this afternoon, the car you drive, the job you have, the loved ones in your life, your family, your friends. It's all from his hand. And we are to receive, not to take as rights, to be, but, but to be seen as gifts, as gifts from God. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving towards God. He is the one who provided all things. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 that godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. We're not going to take anything out. When we pray for our food, we don't ask God to bless the food. We say, thank you, God, for the food. Thank you, God, for this car. Thank you for these friends. Thank you for this job. Thank you for how you have blessed me in these ways by your hand. The big idea again for us this morning is that a healthy church contends for the faith and is thankful for God's provision. A healthy church contends for the faith and is thankful for God's provision. A couple of questions for us. First of all, do you think that demons are real? Do you think that demons are teaching people what to believe? How do you, what do you, how do you process that? Do you think that demons are teaching people what to believe? My encouragement to you is to meditate on Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, 2 Thessalonians 2, and 2 Timothy 3. Let God's word talk to you about demons, about the spiritual world. Paul is very clear. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God explicitly says that some are going to abandon the faith and are going to follow deceiving spirits teachings that come from demonic forces. Paul's very clear. The issue is, what do you do with that? The Bible's very clear. And my encouragement is, look at these passages and pray, God, maybe I really don't appreciate what the Bible says about the spiritual world. Next question, pray for the return of loved ones who have abandoned the faith. When you think about the people in your family who at some point, they started out walking with Christ, but you know what? They've turned and they've walked away and they're, they're following not God. Who are those people? Privately, between you and the Lord, will you pray this week for those people? And if you have trusted people in your life, would you come alongside them and say, you know what, you know Uh, this person that's in my life and I'm struggling and I need prayer support because it's really hard. Pray for those people that God would impress himself upon them that they would return. Lastly, uh, think of 10 things you're thankful to God for. Think about 10 things that you're thankful for. Write them down. Try to make this a daily habit. Give thanks to God for your relationships, for your food, for Diet Coke. Wait, did I say that out loud? Thank God for a good coffee, for your job, for your family, your loved ones, your church. When you think of your family, your loved ones, your relationships, give thanks to God for how he has provided for you. 
And when you sit down for a meal, think before you pray. And thank God for the food. Science writer Michael Bond is a bit of an expert in the traumatic subject of lostness. He writes that being lost is a fear that runs deep in our psyche and culture. Children lost in the woods is a common theme in modern fairy tales and in ancient mythology. Usually in fiction, there's some kind of redemption. Snow White is rescued by the dwarfs. Hansel and Gretel, who are facing certain doom, find their way out. Reality, however, is often more grim. In the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, getting lost was one, one of the most common causes of death uh, for the European settlers, children in America. A child would go off and get lost as we were settling the West, and that was one of the most common ways that people would die because they would simply get lost. Science researcher, researcher Dr. Jan Salman used GPS monitors to track numerous volunteers as they tried to walk in a straight line without tech through Germany's Bienwald Forest in the Sahara Desert. When clouds obstructed the sun, airs quickly accumulated. Small deviations became large ones, and they ended up walking in circles. With no external cues to help them, people will not travel more than around 100 meters from their starting position, regardless of how long they walk for. And that says a lot about our spatial system and what requires to anchor us to our surroundings. In the absence of landmarks and boundaries, our head direction cells can't compute direction and distance and leave us flailing in space. God has given us clear direction. And without the word of God, without the spirit of Christ, informing your conscience, using people in your midst to help you know your true north. As we gather as the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth, without that true north, we will travel in circles. Peter Marshall was a chaplain of the U.S. Senate, and he said this, Give to us clear vision that we may know where to stand and what to stand for. Because unless we stand for something, we shall fall for anything. Paul says in the next verse, 1 Timothy 4, verse 6, If you point these things out to your brothers, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus and brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. A healthy church contends for the faith and is thankful for God's provision. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you, Lord, this morning. We ask, God, that you would help us. Father, to better understand the spiritual world in which we live one of the great ploys of the evil one, God, is try to convince us either that he doesn't exist or to make light of his presence. So God, I pray, Father, that you would help us to be more aware of angels and demons, of your word, the supremacy of Christ, as well as the presence of the evil one, Satan, who seeks to lead us astray. God, may your spirit and your word be the anchor for our souls. And may we come alongside of one another in great patience and love, encouraging one another to be faithful to you. Help us, Father, to be people of great thanksgiving and to appreciate, to appreciate this day and all that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing along today.
tears and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood receive this morning's benediction from Jude, but you, dear friends, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. All God's people said, amen. amen. You're dismissed. Thanks for coming.